My name is Allison Cook, and I work with the Story of Stuff Project, and I'm the Special Projects Coordinator there. I gave a brief overview of the kind of hidden environmental and social costs of our dysfunctional relationship to stuff here in the United States and around the world, um, and talked a little bit about ways to get involved and kind of what I'm most excited about um, in terms of building the uh, building the kind of world that we want to live in. So the Story of Stuff project started actually as a talk that Annie, the woman who is kind of talking in the film, um, used to give, and everyone always thought she should turn it into a movie. Um, and so she finally did in 2007, and um, there, were, there was really no plan to do anything with it at the time. We just thought we were going to make a movie. Um, but the incredible that we, response that we got from people all over the world um, made really clear that we as activists wanted to leverage that opportunity to really see um, how deep we could take the conversation and how engaged, um, take advantage of people wanting to get engaged to really kind of leverage that moment for change. And so in 2008 we created the Story of Stuff project um, and have since made five new films. Um, and created a schools curriculum, a faith curriculum, and a number of additional resources to try and get people excited about the issues that we care about. What about the people who live here? Well, according to these guys, they don't own these resources, even if they've been living there for generations. They don't own the means of production, and they're not buying a lot of stuff. And in this system, if you don't own or buy a lot of stuff, you don't have value. So next, the materials move to production. And what happens there is we use energy to mix toxic chemicals in with the natural resources to make toxic contaminated products. There are over 100,000 synthetic chemicals in use in commerce today. Only a handful of them have even been tested for health impacts, and none have been tested for synergistic health impacts. That means when they interact with all the other chemicals we're exposed to every day. So we don't know the full impact on health and the environment of all these toxic chemicals, but we do know one thing. Toxics in, toxics out. As long as we keep putting toxics into our industrial production systems, we're going to keep getting toxics in the stuff that we bring into our homes and workplaces and schools, and duh, our bodies. Like BFRs, brominated flame retardants, they're a chemical that make things more fireproof, but they are super toxic. They're a neurotoxin. That means toxic to the brain. What are we even doing using a chemical like this? Yet we put it in our computers, our appliances, couches, mattresses, even some pillows. In fact, we take our pillows, we douse them in a neurotoxin, then we bring them home and put our heads on them for eight hours a night to sleep. Now, I don't know, but it seems to me in this country with so much potential, we could think of a better way to stop our heads from catching on fire at night. Well, I think that one of the challenges with the current environmental movement is that we've really individualized the problem um, of the kind of environmental issues that we face. And so we ask people to ride their bike or to bring their cloth bag to the grocery store and to do all those kinds of things. And I think that all of those things are well and good. I do them all myself. I love riding my bike to the work. Um, but that's not the same as political action. And so I would say that on some level, what I want people to do most is to get involved in their communities around issues that they care about. Um, and to transcend not only from their local community, but then also to the national and international scale to look at the larger systemic issues that are affecting the things that they care most about. What happens after all these natural resources are turned into products? Well, it moves here for distribution. Now, distribution means selling all the toxic contaminated junk as quickly as possible. The goal here is to keep the prices down, keep the people buying, and keep the inventory moving. How do they keep the prices down? It's all about externalizing the costs. What that means is that the real costs of making stuff aren't captured in the price. In other words, we aren't paying for the stuff we buy. I was thinking about this the other day. I was walking to work and I wanted to listen to the news, so I popped into a radio shack to buy a radio. I found this cute little green radio for $4.99. I was standing there in line to buy this thing, and I was thinking, how could $4.99 possibly capture the cost of making this radio and getting it into my hands? The metal was probably mined in South Africa. The petroleum was probably drilled in Iraq. 
The plastics were probably produced in China, and maybe the whole thing was assembled by some 15-year-old in a maquiador in Mexico. $4.99 wouldn't even pay the rent for the shelf space it occupied until I came along, let alone part of the staff guy's salary who helped me pick it out, or the multiple ocean cruises and truck rides pieces of this radio went on. That's how I realized I didn't pay for the radio. So who did pay? Well, these people paid with the loss of their natural resource space. These people paid with the loss of their clean air, with increasing asthma and cancer rates. Kids in the Congo paid with their future. 30% of the kids in part of the Congo have dropped out of school to mine coltan, a metal we need for our cheap and disposable electronics. These people even paid by having to cover their own health insurance. All along this system, people pitched in so I could get this radio for $4.99. And none of these contributions are recorded in any accounts book. That's what I mean by the company owners externalize the true costs of production. I think it's about raising awareness in America and around the world that we need to change the way we view consumption and to use our buying power more cautiously mm. and to try and make decisions that, are, that have long-term effects. So you're not just buying a phone knowing that you're gonna buy another phone and another phone just for the sake of having it. Advertisements and media in general plays a big role in this. Each of us in the U.S. is targeted with over 3,000 advertisements a day. We see more advertisements in one year than people 50 years ago saw in a lifetime. And if you think about it, what's the point of an ad except to make us unhappy with what we have? So 3,000 times a day, we're told our hair is wrong, our skin is wrong, our clothes are wrong, our furniture is wrong, our car is wrong, we are wrong, but it can all be made right if we just go shopping. Media also helps by hiding all of this and all of this. So the only part of the materials economy we see is the shopping. The extraction, production, and disposal all happens outside of our field of vision. In the US, we spend three to four times as many hours shopping as our counterparts in Europe do. So we're in this ridiculous situation where we go to work, maybe two jobs even, and we come home and we're exhausted. So we plop down on our new couch and watch TV, and the commercials tell us, you suck. So you gotta go to the mall to buy something to feel better. And then you gotta go to work more to pay for the stuff you just bought. So you come home and you're more tired. So you sit down and you watch more TV, and it tells you to go to the mall again. And we're on this crazy work, watch, spend treadmill. And we could just stop. I think it can help us by raising awareness. I mean, I wish there would be more people there. It seemed like the people who were there probably already are aware. Like myself, I'm an environmental studies major, so I'm pretty, uh, pretty versed on a lot of the problems that we face and the solutions. So I think today's event probably would have been better if it was held outside where people could have just walked by and seen it, would have reached more people. What happens to all the stuff we buy anyway? At this rate of consumption, it can't fit into our houses, even though the average house size has doubled in this country since the 1970s. It all goes out in the garbage. And that brings us to disposal. This is the part of the materials economy we all know the most because we have to haul the junk out to the curb ourselves. Each of us in the United States makes four and a half pounds of garbage a day. That's twice what we each made 30 years ago. All of this garbage either gets dumped in a landfill, which is just a big hole in the ground, or if you're really unlucky, first it's burned in an incinerator and then dumped in the landfill. Either way, they both pollute the air, land, water, and don't forget, change the climate. Incineration is really bad. Remember those toxics back in the production stage? Well, burning the garbage releases the toxics up into the air. Even worse, it makes new super toxics, like dioxin. Dioxin is the most toxic man-made substance known to science, and incinerators are the number one source of dioxin. That means that we could stop the number one source of the most toxic man-made substance known just by stopping burning the trash. We could stop it today. Today, you I'm going to refill my reusable bottle. Oh, nice. Right? right? And let's see. Tomorrow, I'm going to be carpooling with someone else to school. So I think that's a good start. I have uh, two kids. They're five and seven years old. So I will be uh, raising them to be sustainably conscious. Uh, right now at home, they know the difference between landfill, recycle, and compost. And so when they have an item that needs to be thrown away, they know they either throw it in the land or the compost or the recycle. So I'm going to raise my kids who are the future to be conscientious of the earth. So I think that a couple of the things that are really important are to um, 
you know, do, do all of those kind of responsible green things that everybody's always telling you to do. Bring your cloth bag to the grocery store, and bring your reusable coffee mug, and your reusable water bottle, and all those kinds of things. But then also take it to the next level and see what you can do about making Cal State East Bay a bottled water free campus, or making sure that when they update their computer lab that they're responsibly recycling those and not shipping them overseas. And looking at how you can make a systemic impact here on campus, I think, is a really incredible opportunity as a student um, to shift the way that your university does business. What about recycling? Does recycling help? Yes, recycling helps. Recycling reduces the garbage at this end and it reduces the pressure to mine and harvest new stuff at this end. Yes, 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 we should all recycle, but recycling is not enough. Recycling will never be enough for a couple reasons. First, the waste coming out of our houses is just the tip of the iceberg. For every one garbage can of waste you put out on the curb, 70 garbage cans of waste were made upstream just to make the junk in that one garbage can you put out on the curb. So even if we could recycle 100% of the waste coming out of our households, it doesn't get to the core of the problems. Also, much of the garbage can't be recycled, either because it contains too many toxics or it's designed not to be recyclable in the first place. Like those juice packs, where they have layers of metal and paper and plastic all smushed together, you can never separate those for true recycling. So you see, it is a system in crisis. All along the way, we are bumping up against limits. From changing climate to declining happiness, it's just not working. But the good thing about such an all-pervasive problem is that there are so many points of intervention. There are people working here on saving forests and here on clean production, people working on labor rights and fair trade and conscious consuming and blocking landfills and incinerators, and very importantly, on taking back our government so that it really is by the people and for the people. All of this work is critically important. When people along the system get united, we can reclaim and transform this linear system into something new, a system that doesn't waste resources or people. I learned that there are more people who uh, think like I do, that uh, we need to be more respectful of the earth. And I learned that there's um, new designers and policy, policy makers that are trying to come up with new ideas that'll get us on the right road to sustainability. You can watch all of our films for free online at storyofstuff.org. Um, and I would like to share that resource with them.